our eye on tech, we're looking at artificial intelligence. Of course, Google announcing that it has expanded its uh, reach for chatbot Bard, which is available now in 50 more countries. So we're going to be talking about that. But, but basically, generative AI in general, what does it mean? What is it about? Uh, is it going to replace humans with robots everywhere? Uh, Dr. Ajenia Okwechime, she is joining us now. She's a partner, data analytics, and of course, AI leader at Deloitte. Thank you so much for joining us. Good morning to you. Uh, so let's start with definitions for those that don't know. What, what is generative uh, AI? It sounds very organic. Sure. Sure. Good morning. Thank Good morning. you for having me here. So generative AI is a branch of artificial intelligence that is able to generate novel and new content in different modalities like text, like videos, like images, computer code, or even music to generate these in a, in a way that previously would have taken human skill and experience mm. before. Yeah, but yeah. now a computer program is able to generate it. And, and how does it work? It basically is based on foundational models, it, or if uh, you think about it as large language models. For me, uh, the easiest way to sort of explain this, I don't know if you've actually ever tried on your phone when you're texting, if you press on the middle button, you know it tries to predict your next, right, so you keep right. pressing and yeah. it will generate a text. Yeah. That's because it has learned from your previous text messages what are the typical words they used? What are you know, the typical messages? And then it's able to predict what you're supposed to say. But now multiply that by everybody's text messages in this world, all the textbooks that were ever written, all the articles, all the websites, all the music. And then it's able to learn syntax and the relationship between words and the relationship between characters and grammar. Once it has learned the grammar, then it's able to generate new content that we've not seen before. Fantastic. You used the word learn a few times. So is there, it makes me think of machine learning. Is, is it yeah. the same thing? Is there a difference? Is there any nuance yeah. between machine learning and generative sure. AI? That's a very good question. So machine learning, the traditional machine learning at least, you can think about it as having an output for a specific question. And, and typically, when you think of machine learning, you think of two different versions. There's the regression models, which are trained on lots of numeric data and are able to predict a single numeric value. For example, you want to forecast the house prices in Ikoi. That's a value. And then You're there's going the up, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> yep. Yeah. Uh, and, uh, and, and then classification models. Yeah. For example, when you're looking at an image, you've learned from different images of, say, male or female images, like men and women, right. and then you're trying to predict, is this image as a woman or a man? So it's a classification, a categorical output. Whereas the difference with generative models is that the word that it can generate an output. And that means there is a bit of creativity involved, which means there's no one answer. There's no right or wrong answer. It learns, once it learns the grammar and the syntax, it can generate different outputs. And once it learns from different styles of text, it can generate the output on, in different styles. For example, you can answer, ask a question and say, answer it in the form of Henry VIII. Right. It'll go pick up all the Tudor books and the you know, uh, his history books yeah. and then try to mimic how Henry VIII would talk. So there is that. And the second fundamental difference, which I think is very key in how useful it is nowadays in the industry, is the speed to response. So a, a machine learning model, you need to train it on large amounts of data, but then it takes time to train and then it can predict that one particular answer. Whereas a generative model, you can give it all of the Harry Potter books and say, summarize it. Wow. So it, because it has learned, it can actually pick out the right points and give you a summary that makes sense. Or it can answer specific questions because of the text that it has ingested. It can actually give you appropriate responses. Great stuff. So, so um, what, what about real world examples of how this is being used? Yeah, I think, um, what's fascinating is that if you think about real world, I want you to think about any time that you ever need to generate a digital artifact. It could be a report, a financial report or music or content for the game that typically would have taken a lot of human effort and time. Now you can use generative AI to produce. And that means it will reduce the marginal con uh, cost of creating uh, original human and knowledge intensive content. So now think about that in industries. Imagine in the, in the financial services industry, it can actually create financial reports by looking at analyzing your financial, your transactions, and to be able to produce a report that says your month-on-month -month revenue growth has been so-and-so, or there's been you know, a, a, an unusual sort of rise or, or, or a, a drop in your, um, you know, in your uh, finances, yeah. et cetera. So yeah. that's one example. 
When it comes to marketing and creating digital content, you can imagine personalized marketing. So you understand, um, first of all, you can create novel content, right? Which is why, like, for example, oh, you've all seen examples of, oh, create an astronaut riding a horse right. or an avocado chair, which, yeah. you know, doesn't actually exist, but You're it right. can be created. So yeah. marketing can be used in this. And also in HR, for example, it can produce job descriptions. Or again, in, in businesses, it can look at uh, business flows and process flows and be able to uh, pick at um, what are some of the inefficiencies. So basically, the possibility of en possibilities are endless. Yeah, yeah. And again, similar applications in medicine to be able to create personalized medicine. So these are some of the examples that we see today. But some of the major ones is customer service um, engagement. Think about automated call centers. Right. Yes, we're used to sort of like dial this option, dial that option, or like a voice comes in. But now you can imagine a full on avatar actually being able to interact with you and understand from your history what you can do. Or similarly in the hospitals, you know, when they need to check out patients, there are all these like check out nurses that, you know, take away that time and effort from the nurses that are able to look at your history at hospital stay and be able to check you out. So these are some of the applications that we see in the industries today. Um, and one other major one that is applicable to all industries is a generation of synthetic data. For example, imagine um, fraud detection and building models for fraud detection is very uh, challenging at the moment because of the unbalanced data. Hopefully you have a lot more genuine transactions than you have fraudulent transactions. Right. So when you're trying to put those in the model so the model can learn, you don't have enough examples of fraudulent transactions for you to really be able to have a comprehensive model. But by creating synthetic fraudulent data, you're actually able to balance it out and you know, have a lot more reasonable models and efficient models going forward. Thank you for that. Thank you for the breakdown. So at least those watching can know, okay, this isn't just a fad. There's actually real world applications for this. But I want to go back to the, the astronaut riding a horse, which you said does not exist. But yeah. the, well, the, for us in the media, we constantly have to be on our toes to point out deep fakes, misinformation Absolutely. and so on. What about that risk on the ethical side? Yeah, you know, you're absolutely right. There are risks with artificial intelligence that everybody needs to be aware of. And they're not just the deep fakes or we call hallucination because generative AI can generate a content, but nobody knows if it's true or not mm. because you don't know the source that it came from. So there is that risk, but that's not the only risk. You can also have a risk of um, ethical, ethically wrong outputs or biases in the models. Because right. remember the key here is that the model is trained based on existing data. If you don't use the right data to train the model, then you run the risk of actually producing something that is not um, uh, equitable or it's not fair. For example, imagine a model that's been trained on Caucasian faces and now it's brought to Nigeria to be able to um, you know, do face recognition and, and uh, extend the financial facilities based on that. And if it cannot recognize the face because it's never been trained on an African face, already you are putting them at disadvantage. Right. Or imagine traditional jobs, say software engineering, uh, traditionally have always been taken up by men. Right. Uh, you know, properly graduates from top universities. So if you were to, uh, you know, build a model that based on that gives you a job offer, women would already be at a disadvantage. So these are some of the things that are real and everybody needs to be aware of. And, and the way to sort of go about it is putting safeguarding in place. So both regulators, for example, I don't know if you've heard of the European Artificial Intelligence Act. Right, now right. the European Union has the AI law that puts uh, guardrails and safeguarding as to what you can use it for, what you can in terms of data protection, ethical uses. Organizations like Deloitte, we have the trustworthy AI framework. So that, that you know, helps you monitor for transparency, for fairness, for ethical usage. So it, it really is a key message to organizations that you're responsible for what you build and you put out there. And, and there are tools that you can continuously track and monitor the AI risks. And the minute you see that it's going wrong, you actually go back and retrain. You also need to have trained, skilled uh, uh, individuals who know how to pick the data that all parties are considered, depending on their application, to pick the data that is most useful and fair to that particular application. Great stuff. Uh, Dr. Jenner, I wish we had more time because this is such a fascinating. I know you guys have some reports and stuff in the future that you're going to be putting out. Yes, absolutely. We have to have you back to talk more about this. Uh, sure. Dr. Jenner, a question of course, a partner AI leader uh, at Deloitte. Uh, thank you so much. And also head of data analytics, right? Thank That's you so right. much. We appreciate your time.